Good morning, everybody. He is risen. Amen. We serve a risen Savior today, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm glad y'all are here, and we're excited. Those who are watching us on Facebook or YouTube or the, what's the other place we're going to, webpage, whatever, uh, thank y'all for joining us today. I kind of feel like one of those TV evangelists the, right now. I'm not going to say nothing. I got, I'm just going to leave, leave it alone, but we're glad y'all are here. And uh, we're going to celebrate, and uh, we're going to have church this morning, make some quick announcements. Uh, if you read the bulletin, currently everything that we have scheduled, we're leaving it scheduled. You don't have a bulletin? Okay, let me read it to you then. <laughs> some things will never change, no matter what. Uh, coming up in May, uh, currently all the activities for April are, are put on hold, but May 9th, the Mother's Day brunch, if you have any questions about that, you can see Barb. She'll give you the details. The Silver Souls picnic out at the Rawls Camp, the 21st of May. Uh, we are planning as a church to do a celebration for a Memorial Day. Uh, we're going to go to Micah State Park and have a picnic, and uh, that's going to be on the 25th. Uh, VBS is still on the um, calendar. So is Kids Camp in July and our Youth Camp uh, in July in Georgia. All those events are still on the calendar, and I'm excited about it. Keep them in your prayer. And uh, we're going to continue to move forward uh, with everything that we do. Amen? Amen. So uh, we're going to do things a little different this morning. I'm going to ask you all to stand. And uh, we're going to take the time. Uh, normally that we're walking around and shaking hands, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, we're just going to spend some time in prayer and uh, praying for our country, for our leadership, uh, for doctors and nurses and all that, if you will. And uh, it just, uh, it's a trying time. A lot of people are feeling a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And uh, we need to lift them up in prayer. So let's do that. Heavenly Father, once again, we just come to you and we just thank you and we praise you for who you are. Today we recognize and we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, I just pray that it's not just a one-time deal, it's not just a one-day uh, celebration, but it's every day of our life that we should celebrate and recognize Christ risen from the dead. And I pray, God, as, as we go about our daily lives, that every day, that every chance we get, We'll be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those we come in contact with. Father, we want to pray for so many people today, for our, our, our country, for our president and vice president, for those who are making decisions, our governor, all the way down to the city mayors and our county commissioners and different ones, Lord. I just pray that you just give them wisdom as they make choices and decisions. We pray for our doctors and the nurses, Father, for the first responders, Lord. So many of them are feeling pressure and stress, Lord, and, and, and worry. And I just pray, God, that you would just speak to them and just give them comfort. And, Father, now as we enter this time of worship, I just pray for your will to be done in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So. Mm -hmm.
2,000 years ago, death gave way to victory when the stone was rolled away and we could see an empty tomb. And our victory is in Jesus Christ. What a day to celebrate. What a gift we've been given from our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we come to thank you for the privilege you give us of standing and singing praise to you, of lifting the name of your Son, of proclaiming your word. Father, I pray that you would bless this time. I pray you would bless the gift and the giver. I pray you would multiply to your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. stand together.
there's a list of my along of all my sins of everything that I've done wrong I'm so ashamed there's nowhere left for me to hide this is the day I must answer for my life my fate is in the judge's hands but then he turns to me I can't begin to comprehend what kind of grace would take the place for all my sins. I stand in awe now that I have been set free as I look at that cross, cause it should have been me. My fate was in the now you stand. stretch them out for me and said I know you I love you I gave my life to save you the pay the price for mercy my I'm falling on my knees to thank you With everything I am I praise you So grateful for the words I heard you say YouTube and Facebook. We uh, do appreciate it and uh, especially appreciate the cards and the calls of encouragement. Uh, it is appreciated. It's good to know you're there and uh, we're praying that we'll be through with this unusual situation as soon as possible and we look forward to gathering together around a fellowship table and enjoying one another's presence. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 28. 2,000 years ago, an event took place that changed our world, changed our destiny. Those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ have been given eternal life because of what Christ did 2,000 years ago. Now, please understand what I'm saying. It's not that Christ died on a cross. Many people died on a cross in that time and in that culture. But what is amazing and what is supernatural is that he conquered death. 
If Christ was still in the grave, you and I would have no hope. If Christ did not rise from the grave, you and I would be lost and have no possibility of heaven itself. I was watching television last night and a reporter went out and interviewed seven or eight people and he asked them, what does Easter mean? What is the, what is the basis, what is the meaning of Easter? They didn't know. One guy mentioned the name Jesus Christ, but he didn't know how it was connected. That's a little scary, quite frankly. Easter today, according to the world, is about a bunny rabbit. It's about the Easter bunny, and it's about buying chocolate bunnies and hunting Easter eggs. It's about jelly beans and gifts. Just like Christmas has become a holiday about Santa Claus. Thanksgiving has become a holiday where we're to thank one another for being friends. And the pilgrims thank the Indians for what they had done. I assure you the pilgrims were thanking God. But we've turned Easter into something that it was never intended to be. And you know, it doesn't bother me so much what the world says about Easter, what bothers me is what the world does not say about Easter. And it's a little scary and discouraging when we see people, average people walking the street that don't even know what Easter means. It's just a, another holiday. I assure you it is so much more than that. There are four things that the world will not tell you about Easter that you should know, and I want to share with you this morning. But look with me first in Matthew chapter 28. If you have a Bible handy, follow along with me if you will. Matthew chapter 28 verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. It's not a coincidence at the end of that passage, at the end of that same chapter. Immediately after the resurrection, Jesus gives these instructions. He came unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Dunamis, like dynamite, all power in heaven and in earth. You and I cannot imagine all power. We can't comprehend. We can't take it into our mind, all power. But Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Now the power of life itself, power over death itself, is given into the hands of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That word world is eon in the Greek, and it means the end of time itself. There will never be a time that Christ is not with us. Now think about that. That should be an encouraging thought. There'll never be a hardship. There'll never be a difficult time. There'll never be a, a time like right now that Christ is not here and aware and he cares. 
We serve a God that loves us. The first thing that the world will not tell you about Easter is the unfathomable price that was paid for Easter. Today the world tells us that we should buy. Buy things, buy gifts, buy items, buy objects. That's what Easter is about. Merchandising. Easter is about giving gifts. Easter, Easter is about buying things. And any time, any Easter that I can remember, you go into a store, you'll find it's been merchandised just like Christmas, just like Thanksgiving. In fact, it's become just another holiday. But there's an unfathomable price that was paid, and it was paid 2,000 years ago. In the 51st Psalm, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You were born with a sin nature, and a price had to be paid for that sin. They say, wait a minute, that sweet little innocent baby, you've heard me say before, yeah, that little baby was born with a sin nature. Just stick around for a while. Just hang around. You'll see it come out. Now, I believe in the age of Recollection. I believe that a child is under God's hand and under God's protection till they reach a time where they can make a decision. But when we reach that age, we do make a decision. It is to sin. And we engage in sin. We blame Adam and Eve for original sin, but we do quite well on our own. The price that was paid on Easter 2,000 years ago was a price that Christ did not owe, but we did. It was a price for my sin and for your sin. It was a price that had to be paid because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There was an unfathomable price that was paid. Sin is anything that displeases God. Murder displeases God. Stealing at any level, big or small, displeases God. God. Lying displeases God. Adultery displeases God. Impure thoughts displease God. Unforgiveness displeases God. Unjust anger displeases God. Disobedience to parents displeases God. Many other things displease God. Sin displeases God and there is a price to pay and Christ paid that price for the sins of mankind. It's hard to take it in. It's hard to fully understand it. I can't get my mind around the fact that I have a God that loves me enough to pay the price of my sin. 2,000 years ago at Calvary, we become debtors to God because of our sin. I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The logical conclusion is that we're the ones that should pay for our sin. Doesn't it make sense? And yet because of God's great grace, his amazing grace, his amazing love, he paid the price so that we could realize our proper position of fellowship with him. The world won't tell you about the unfathomable price that is paid at Easter. And the world won't tell you about the resurrection power of Easter. In Romans chapter 3 it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. How does that happen? How do we get to that point? How do we receive the gift of eternal life? We say, man, that's great. That's, That's amazing to me that God would love us that much. It's incredible to me to understand that I have a God that loves me so much. He would pay the ultimate price for me so I can fellowship with him, so I can be forgiven of him. The world won't tell you about resurrection power. There was a day when Christ was crucified and he was laid in a borrowed tomb and the stone was rolled into its place and it fell into place. And Satan thought he had won and Caiaphas thought he had won and Pilate thought he had won. That's the end of that. I won't have to tend to him anymore. I won't have to put up with him anymore. But there was a day when the stone was rolled away. There was a day, and and, and you've heard me say so many times, the stone was not removed so Christ could get out. In John chapter 1, we're told he's a creator. 
Jesus Christ spoke light and life into this world. He made that stone. Christ didn't need the stone removed, but we did. Because the women were coming to the tomb, because the world was coming to see the tomb of Christ, but what they would see would be an empty tomb. Always when I read that passage in Matthew and it talks about the angel of the Lord coming down, I don't know if that was Gabriel or Michael that came down. Whoever had the honor, whoever had the privilege of coming down, I kind of detect in that passage just a little bit of smart aleck, just a little bit of a smart aleck angel that rolls the stone away and is sitting on the stone waiting for the women to come, knowing that they're coming. They're coming to find a dead Savior. They're coming to find Christ in the tomb. But the stone is rolled away so they could see the tomb is empty and he's not there. He's not in the tomb. And we see today an empty tomb. The world will not tell you about the resurrection power of Easter. It is a completion of the power that God put in the hands of Jesus Christ. It's a completion of God's divine power. Not just the power of life, but the power over death as well. It's complete. It's total. And it belongs to him. The tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. He is risen. Easter is a day when the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is clearly demonstrated and celebrated. For 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, proving to him that he was indeed alive from the dead. He'd conquered death. There have been others that have risen from the dead. Jesus himself brought at least three people back from the dead, but they died. And he's still alive. We serve a risen Savior. The world will not tell you about the resurrection power of Easter. And the world will not tell you about the eternal promise of Easter. The promise of Easter is simply this. Jesus is the first to be raised from the dead, but not the last. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death, I have the hope of eternal life. Because Jesus Christ has conquered death, you can have eternal life through him. He loves you that much. He cares for you that much. He cared enough for you to die in your place. And he conquered death so that you could live for eternity with him. The world won't tell you about the eternal promise of Easter. Through him, everyone will be raised from the dead, some to eternal life and some to eternal damnation. The choice is yours. The choice is Christ. Those that have placed their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ will be raised to spend eternity with him in heaven. The world won't tell you about the eternal promise of Easter, and the world won't tell you about the divine priority of Easter. Jesus has already paid the price for your sin. Easter can be expensive. I'll probably not mention I have two grandkids. We buy them stuff. We like, I enjoy buying them stuff. Nanette enjoys buying them stuff. In fact, she was sending some stuff to our daughter and she was looking around for something she could put in the box for the grandkids. It's important. What an amazing gift God has given us. What an amazing gift God has given us. The price for your Easter was paid 2,000 years ago. You don't have to invest in Easter. God already has. He's already paid the price for Easter so you can enjoy the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The world won't tell you about the divine priority of Easter, but God knew that you could not fellowship with him and you could not come into eternity with him without the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And the ultimate price was paid on a place called Golgotha, on a cross. There are people today that think that forgiveness of sin comes from their own self-efforts, from their own good works. They think if they do enough good stuff, God will accept them into heaven. On your best day, you're not good enough to make heaven. The Bible says our righteousness, our best day is as filthy rags before God. Can you imagine the comparison of your best day, the best deed you've ever done in your life compared to Jesus Christ? It just doesn't compare. He's so far above it. His righteousness is so far above ours. That's why we needed him. That's why we needed him to come. That's why he came 
and died. The priority of Easter is that you accept the gift that Jesus has already paid on the cross. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's pretty simple when you think about it. It's Jesus Christ or eternity without God. Now, you don't hear that in a lot of pulpits because it's not pleasant to hear. We don't like to hear about condemnation. We just like to hear God is love and a loving God would never send anyone to hell, and that's correct. He doesn't. We send ourselves when we reject the gift that he's given us. We send ourselves when we reject his son, Jesus Christ. We send ourselves when we think we can be good enough for heaven. You cannot. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ. The world will not tell you the price of Easter or the power of Easter or the promise of Easter or the priority of Easter. But I just did. And you cannot say you didn't hear. You cannot say you didn't know. The question today is, what will you do with Jesus Christ? If you could travel back 2,000 years, if you could travel back to Jerusalem at the time of Christ, if you could travel back to the place of the skull and that that even today, if you go to Israel, you can see the clear indication of a skull that is Golgotha, that is Mount Calvary. If you could stand there and we could stand together and we could observe the cross of Jesus Christ and we could see that individual hanging between two thieves and we could see the Son of God, the Lamb of God, suspended between heaven and earth and we could begin in some way to understand who he is, we would fall to our face. We would be thankful to God. The world will tell you about the Easter Bunny, but the world will not tell you about the Savior, Jesus Christ. This will pass. This situation we're in, the difficulties we're having will pass. There'll be another crisis that will come along. We'll deal with that. But the most important decision you will ever make is not what you do about a coronavirus. It's what you will do about Jesus Christ. It's eternal. What will you do with him? What will you do with Christ? If you're watching on social media this morning, I invite you to consider your relationship to Jesus Christ. If you're here in the sanctuary, I invite you. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. I invite you to make a decision about Christ. You may want to pray. And if you're at home, I invite you to pray with me now. And I'd like to take time for us to pray together. The first thing I want to pray about is your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's so much more important than anything that happens that man can control or can't. Let's pray. Father, we've come to this place to thank you for knowing that you're very much aware of what we're going through. And Father, I come to take time to thank you for those leaders in our nation that are making very difficult decisions. I pray that you would give them an uncommon wisdom to make the right decisions. I pray that your face would be before them and they would understand that you're there and you're in charge and you've placed them in places of responsibility. I pray, Father, for those medical people that are dealing directly with those that are sick. I pray your hand of safety upon them. I pray, Father, you would give them wisdom to minister to these people effectively. I pray that you would keep them safe. I pray, Father, for our first responders that often make initial contact with these people. I pray for their health and safety as well. I pray, Father, they would understand that your hand is upon this. I pray, Father, that you would be with our nation itself. In a time of difficulty, a time of strain, a time of uncertainty, Father, this nation belongs to you. And I pray, Father, we would look up. I pray that this might be a time when we would raise our vision, when we would look above the circumstances that we find ourselves in and that we would be reminded that you're still there. I pray, Father, that 
throughout this world, you will use what's taking place, even this day, that you would use it for your glory. I pray that you would turn it to good. I pray that it would be an opportunity for closed doors to be opened, for closed eyes to see, for deaf ears to hear, for people that would normally not want to hear about your son to be willing to listen. I pray that your people, Father, would respond. I pray that we as, as your people, we that carry your name, would take your name to those that do not know, that we would obey your command and take your word to the world, that we would understand that all power is given to you, both in heaven and on earth. Father, you're in charge, and we belong to you. We're your property, and we need to feel your presence and your touch. I pray, Father, that you would walk with us through this time of crisis. I pray that you would open doors of opportunity for us to be creative in how we get your word out. I pray that we would have wisdom to make right decisions. I pray that response would come from those that have never prayed to ask you into their heart. I pray that your Holy Spirit will move both here and in homes that are watching. Father, the methods always change but the message never does. It is your son crucified and risen from the dead. In his holy name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me for a moment? It may be that you'd like to come and pray, return to your seat. I'd be honored to pray with you if you would like. But if you're here and you would like to pray, please do. If you're at home and you're watching this and you would like to pray with someone, call. And we will contact you. We will pray with you. It is our prayer that many would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. Father, I come this day and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight. I pray, Father, for those that may have never heard the message of Easter. I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in hearts. I pray that souls would be saved. We lift it up to you, Father. We know you're in charge. We know it's in your hands. We admit to that, and we thank you for your love. I pray your blessings upon those that are here. I pray your blessings upon those that will hear this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.